and good evening. Um, when, when, when Chris over here, Chris over here uh, mentioned that he saw Mandela, the painting of Mandela, beaming down on him, it reminded me of that fabulous smile that Nelson Mandela had, which lit up the world when you were in his presence and he smiled, and I think John referred to that as well. My personal memories of Nelson Mandela are limited to his leadership and indomitable courage in the 1963 Ravalia trial, in which for nine months I and the other defence lawyers worked with him almost every day. My first meeting with him was in October 1963 in the interview room at Pretoria Jail. I, as the attorney for the leaders of the uh, Band African National Congress, uh, which was, had just begun with the advocates who defended Nelson Mandela, that is, the Bram Fisher, George Bezos, and Arthur Chaskelson. And having just begun our conversation, there was no Nelson Mandela there at the beginning. And suddenly, after 10 minutes, the door was flung op open and Nelson Mandela strode into the room. He had been brought from Robben Island that very morning where he's serving a five-year sentence for under the Suppression of, Commun of Communism Act. Mandela was clad in South African re regulation prisons garb for black prisoners, short trousers, open sandals, and a khaki open neck shirt. He looked hollow cheeked and had lost a great deal of weight. His manner, however, was as always a friendly, confident leader. A adapting appropriately to any challenge. After embracing his co-accused and the other lawyers whom he already knew, he in no way deterred by his short trousers, quite naturally took charge of the consultation. We explained how serious the charges were against them for attempting to overthrow the state by violent revolution. Under the Sabotage Act, a person could be convicted to death, sentenced to death for throwing a stone through a window with political intent. Accordingly, it was clear that for the offences which Mandela and the others were charged, death by hanging was almost inevitable if they were found guilty. But he and his co-accused did not seem phased about this. He explained that their lives were of secondary importance to the cause. They intended that their conduct in the trial would inspire their followers until freedom for all was achieved, even if they were imprisoned or executed. They were not concerned with the legalities of the charge. They were concerned with the politics. They readily admitted that almost all of them had taken part in a political campaign which was designed to bring about the overthrow of the government. They had no intention of denying these facts in the witness box. Mandela's view was that it was the responsibility of leaders to lead, and he accepted responsibility for the acts of all his followers. In the light of Mandela's instructions, the strategy for the trial became clear. The government intended the trial to be a show trial aimed at discrediting the accused and all they stood for. Nelson Mandela also intended to, it to be a show trial, but it would be a trial which would show the world the justice of the cause for which he and his co-accused 
were fighting. They would put the government on trial in the court of world opinion. The trial began with the registrar of the court reading the charge. Accused number one, Nelson Mandela, how do you plead to the indictment served upon you? Mandela stood up in the dock and calmly answered, and the government should be in the dock, not me. I plead not guilty. Now the accused followed the same approach, all fully aware that if found guilty, the likely sentence would be death by hand. <coughs> the prosecution case began and five months later came to an end. <coughs> the defence strategy, driven by Nelson Mandela, was that he would speak from the dock, outlining the evils of the apartheid system and the reasons why the ANC, after for 50 years of violent protest, which had achieved nothing other than more oppressive legislation, had no alternative other than to resort to violence against government institutions. After he had spoken, the plan was that Walter Sassoulu and the other accused would give evidence under oath of the appalling impact of the system of apartheid on the lives of the non-white population. A few days before the defence case began, Nelson Mandela handed me his handwritten statement and asked me to have it typed for reading in court. This I did and distributed the transcript to the other defence lawyers and it had ended, we saw that it ended, with his well-known declaration that he was prepared to die for his beliefs. We, the defence lawyers, pointed out that such a speech could be taken by the judge as an invitation to sentence him to death, and we tried to persuade him to leave it out. However, he was not willing to do this, so the speech was handed back to me to be finally re uh, retyped, to take account of a few minor amendments. I could not bear the thought of Mandela being hanged and decided that on the retyped version I would leave out the prepared to die sentence <laughs> and handed the retyped speech back to him. The next day I received a note from Mandela asking for the sentence I had omitted to be put back. <laughs> but he did make one tiny concession, which in fact George Bezos, the great human rights lawyer, had suggested to him, and that he added in, if needs be, <laughs> it is an idea for which I'm prepared to die. <laughs> On Monday, 23 April 1964, Bram Fischer opened for the defence, outlining the defence case, and ended, the defence case, my lord, will commence with a statement from the dock by Nelson Mandela, who personally took part in the establishment of a conto with Suisse. The atmosphere in the court, was, which was packed, was electric. Armed police stood at every door. Outside the car, court in the square, the police dogs spayed, and solid lines of policemen scowled at the crowd of singing ANC supporters. Im impeccably in dressed in an elegant suit, tall and powerful, looking every bit the leader that he was, Nelson Mandela began very slowly and very quietly to read the statement which he had prepared in a flat, even voice. At no stage did he raise his voice very much or change from the slow, measured speech with which he had started. Gradually, as he spoke, the silence became more and more pro profound until it seemed that no one in the court dared move or breathe. After two and a half hours, he ended. 
During my lifetime, I dedicated myself to the struggle of the African people. I fought against white domination and I fought against black domination. I cherished the ideal of a democratic and free society in which all persons live together in harmony and with equal opportunities. At this moment, he paused, a long pause, in which one could hear a pin drop in the court. And then looking squarely at the judge, he finished. It is an idea which I hope to live for and to achieve. And then dropping his voice very low, he added, but if needs be, it is an ideal for which I am prepared to die. There was a silence in the court for a minute until everyone burst into tears, or so many did. Mortis Sassoula then entered the witness box, followed by the other accused. All of them stood up brilliantly to cross-examination. Walter's evidence in a three-day cross-examination was masterful. At the end of the defence case, Justice the Fed found all the accused guilty, except for Rusty Bernstein, who was charged and adjourned the court for sentence. The accused were then sent back to Pretoria Jail, where we went to consult with them about leaving evidence, leading evidence in mitigation of sentence. The strain and tension was becoming almost unbearable for the lawyers. Yet the only matter Nelson Mandela and his co-accused wanted to discuss was how they should behave in court when the death sentence was passed. He told them that the judge would ask the first accused, Nelson Mandela, have you any reason why the death sentence should not be passed? And Della decided that he would have a lot to say. <laughs> he would tell the court that if they thought by sentencing him to death, this would oust the liberation movement, they were wrong. That he was prepared to die for his believe, beliefs. Such an address was hardly designed to facilitate an appeal. His answer was simple. If sentenced to death, he would not appeal as an appeal might be interpreted by the supporters as an act of weakness. As you all know, after the adjournment, the accused was sentenced to life imprisonment. Ron Fisher and I then went, went to Robben Island to consult with Mandela and the accused about an appeal against their life imprisonment sentence, which we as lawyers recommended he should do as there was also every prospect of getting an acquittal for Kathy Cathrada and Raymond Mishlava. However, he and his co-accused decided that an appeal, as I said before, would, not, would be seen by their followers as a sign of weakness, and they wanted their conduct to be an inspiration to their followers. And such was the extraordinary solidarity with each other that a decision was made that no appeal by any accused would be lodged. And as an example of that solidarity, Kathy Kathrada and Raymond Schlitmerschlava served with Nelson Mandela 27 years in prison. It was Mandela's leadership that saved his own life and those of his co-accused. He was the leader of the other leaders of the ANC and he treated all the co-accused as co-leaders. No important decision was ever made with the, out the agreement of all the accused. Almost always when there was a discussion with different views, Nelson Mandela would turn to Walter Sassoulou, who had been his mentor, and say, Walter, what is your view on the issue? And he would listen very carefully and normally follow Walter's wise advice. And Walter, who had no education at all, was incredibly wise. Throughout the trial, Mandela remained calm. And although angry at times at the behaviour of the prosecution and the police, would never raise his voice or in any way become emotional. Such was his aura as a leader that even the prison, prison officials respected him and never dared to treat him in the way that they treated other non-white 
prisoners. As I have said, the solidarity of all the accused was incredible. The strain of living together in the shadow of death ought to have been impossible to deal with. But there was never any friction amongst the accused. They all supported one another and all looked up to Mandela as their leader and followed his example. When Mandela was released after 27 years and became president of South Africa, I only saw him on a handful of occasions, but I particularly remember two such occasions. The one was that he was talking at a meeting in London and spotted me in the audience. With his mischievous sense of humour, he interrupted his speech to announce loudly, Oh, I see Joel Joffe there, the man who sent me to jail for 27 years. <laughs> The other occasion was about two years before his death, where, like John, I saw him in his home in, in uh, Houghton. He had invited my wife, Annette, and myself to visit him at his home in Houghton, and we watched him having breakfast. When I was about to leave, he said to me, Joel, and he was, he was frail then, he remembered my name, and he said, Joel, when you return to England, would you please pass on my best wishes to Elizabeth? <laughs> I said, Elizabeth who? <laughs> to which he responded, Elizabeth the Queen, and went on to say, when I first met her privately at Buckingham Palace, she asked if she could call me Nelson, and I said yes, and I then asked, could I call her Elizabeth? <laughs> and she said yes. <laughs> I explained to Madiba that the Queen and I were not on visiting terms. <laughs> and I would write to her, sending his warm regards. And in due course, got a letter back from her, I think, second or third in command, saying thank you. And the Queen sends her best wishes. To Nelson Mandela. <laughs> I have over here, and I know John is very cross with me because I've exceeded my time, but this look, I'm, I have here a, a, a book which in, in it is, this pre, is the typescript of the speech which Mandela gave at his trial, which after he had spoken, he signed and gave to me. There's also the note which he sent me, asking me to reinsert his willingness to die, <laughs> as well as the notes in his own handwriting of what he would have said to the judge if sentenced to death. They read, I meant everything I said. The blood of many patriots in this country has been shed for democracy in conformity with civilised standards. If I must die, I declare to all that I will meet my fate like a man. Thank you.